Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Marion Woods, and it is indeed a privilege and honor for me to engage in this conversation with Claudette Colvin. I have just a couple of opening comments to make, and then we'll be hearing from Claudette. Claudette Colvin decision in March of 1955 to refuse to give up her seat on that bus in Montgomery, Alabama was a dress rehearsal for what was to come later. The defiance of convention and customs by a young 15-year-old black girl, Claudette Colvin, places her in the same historical position as Crispus Attucks, who was the first to defy and the first to die in launching the American Revolution. The history of the roles played by unsung black heroes and heroines are not often highlighted in our history. We cannot depend or rely solely on the dominant society for the preservation of culture of minority groups. We must chronicle our own history and transfer this to our children through those apparatus or mechanisms available to us. For without that, the majority culture will colonize our minds and prevent us from continuing the struggle that Claudette and others began. With the help of this apparatus, facing history, and through the work of an artist such as Aweli Makiba, we will find ourselves without a sense of value, tradition, or mores which contribute to our development, without which we would be a lost people. We want to express our appreciation for this opportunity to facing history, for bringing to our conscience after 50 years the courage of Claudette Coven. <laughs> Fifty years after her experience, as a woman, she is finally receiving her due as the first to sow the seeds of future change in civil rights laws. Through her courage, and her heroic defiance of the convention of the day. When that bus driver said, give me those seats, and she decided not to get up, is remarkable. For this kind of courage is the foundation that underlies and gives reality to all other virtues and personal values. The kind of decision that she made takes courage. As a person who grew up in the South, it's incredible to me to even visualize that someone would question that system. And Claudette, in your own words, would you tell us why on that day, as a 16-year-old, you decided not to give up your seat? Oh, thank you. Um, as I relate my story, uh, first, I was 15, not 16. 15. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, it happened March the 2nd. And as you know, February, we had Negro History Week, I mean, say Negro History Month. And at February, we had been discussing in classrooms all the different injustices that Jim Crow law had created. So uh, I had a teacher, by the name is Ms. Nesbitt, uh, all the other teachers had said that she was an unorthodox teacher. And uh, she taught me about the Constitution and what not to do and what to expect or what we should not do as black citizens. And I was, I, uh, you know, under the uh, segregation laws. So um, it was the arrest of one of my classmates what triggered me really triggered me. It was because this student was from the same school I was from. Uh, he was arrested for having a, 
affair with a white woman. And later he was uh, executed, he was electrocuted. And um, during that time, the students had to go around and collect money uh, the best way we could, selling cook and bake cookies sales, uh, different things, chances, and you know, going around collecting. What we was uh, going through this in a such a way that you couldn't, you know, really, really get, uh, you know, you got emotional about it. The reason why you got emotional about it is because when the same thing happened to a black girl, a black girl, and this involved a white man, nothing was done about it. So that was one of the things. Uh, it was several things. Uh, you know, there was white sign. That was white. Uh, white sign saying white, and then there was another sign saying color. Now this was throughout the South. Or this was at the stores. This was on the bus, and then we, you know, we didn't go to church together. So I was very aware of that. So that was one of the the first thing that triggered me. In addition to the signs, colored only, white only drinking fountains and, I guess, different tasting water. Uh, what are the other things the Jim Crow experienced? Uh, as a child, I remember this vividly. Uh, I was in a five and ten. Oh, my goodness, the aroma of that the, uh, lunch area. The, you could smell it in the, oh, goodness. But we couldn't sit down and eat. We had a little tiny narrow space uh, at the back. Where you had to, where you could buy hot dogs and soda, and that, and I remember that. That was one of the things. And then when you were shopping, it was, I remember this little white girl, <laughs> it, you know, like the, and I'm, just, I'm speaking back some uh, 50 years ago. It was uh, these coloring books, and I had picked up my coloring book, and she had picked up hers. So I was uh, relating to my mother, and I was naming some of the characters. I was saying, oh, mother, look, Cinderella, okay, okay, Snow White, and all I was saying, all the pictures, you know, the uncolored pictures, you know, the little diagrams they have. And the little white girl looked over. She didn't like her, her coloring book. And I, but then she looked, and her mother said, give me the book. And she just snatched the book. She didn't, you know, she didn't say, will you have to change the book? a coloring book for my daughter. She just snatched it out of my hand and, and my mother, and I said, give it back. My mother just gave me a backhand slap. And I said, why did you do that, Mama? She said, this is a white world. You cannot do that in, a, in front of white people. They always have the first choice. So as a kid, that stuck with me. Thank you. I think now would be a good time uh, to have a presentation by Awali Makiba. Awali. Were you conscious of the things that were going on in 1955 in the civil rights area? Yes, I, uh, through the teachers, my history teacher, Ms. Uh, Joseph Lawrence, uh, she had taught me uh, about the world 
and the history of the world. And one way she did it, she had us to subscribe for current events. And that teach you, you know, that takes a, a large area. It covers a large area. It, and I learned about the first time a teach, black teacher really discussed Africa. And at that time, uh, there was a movement in Africa. And the, the uh, people, was, they was called the Mau Mau. The black people that was having the uprising, uprising, they was called the Mau Mau. And then in the United States, there was Brown versus Board of Education. So I knew about that, and I knew about uh, black people, black the uh, uh, black women political organization in Montgomery would go to the city council. I'm say to the city council to ask for better housing, paved street, and indoor plumbing. So. I knew about you know these things was going on. Who were your role models? Uh, did you know Rosa Parks and Martin King at the time? Uh, I didn't. Uh, I knew Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks knew my family, and I didn't know it uh, until I met Rosa Parks at, at her organization, and she introduced her group. Uh, she knew my mother, my mother, and Rosa Parks and her brother. They knew each other, and my mother would go to Rosa Parks' house and uh, play and play with her brother Sylvester and, and Rosa. So, uh, and her brother Sylvester, Rosa was much a uh, little older, but uh, Rosa uh, knew my family, so she wasn't a, a stranger. And during that summer, to raise money again, our uh, I ran for Miss NAACP, and then it was <laughs> it was two other contestants, but Rosa Parks was my chaperone, and I I spent the night with Rosa because it would be too late to get a bus to go back cross town, and um, Rosa Parks' mother baked cookies, and we went dough to dough selling chocolate chip cookies. And she would tell me, Claudette, don't eat them up too. <laughs> she said, we need to sell these. <laughs> and um, Rosa, she was a very reserved lady. Uh, I talked more with Rosa's mother, and she told me some of the story about Pine Level, where they come from, that they had lived a short while. And um, Rosa told, you know, Rosa talked about uh, my mother and uh how I, how she felt about it, how she felt about the uh, she had had some similar experience, different kinds, but she knew about the injustice that I had. And then she later introduced me to a group, and they uh, selected me to be secretary for that group. And that was uh, I was very uh, glad of that. And but Rosa lived, wasn't in, didn't live in my community. She lived across town, and she lived uh, uh, on Cleveland Avenue, and I lived on the area called Kings Hill. King Hill was a little less affluent than the other black communities, because uh, we were sandwiched in between two white communities. Uh, one was Capitol Heights, and one was uh, Highland Garden, and we lived on this elevated land landscape. And we could look down on the other black com community, and we call ourselves King Hill. <laughs> <laughs> and we, and um, you know, it was very interesting, and uh, it was an enjoyable childhood, and playing and listening to rock and roll music. And we later had to had our park called King Hill Park. We only had two parks in Montgomery. One was King Hill Park, and I was glad that they had chosen our, our community to put this park. And they had one called Washington Park because we couldn't go to the white parks. We could walk <laughs> through the paths to our community, but we couldn't sit on the park benches. That's how Jim Crow law was in those days. You couldn't sit on the uh, park benches, so but you could walk through the park. So um, it was a long time before uh, people began to see that this change was taking place. You know, the revolution, what I'm saying, was in the air. 
And even in my community, people was talking about it. But they didn't want, they would talk about it, but they didn't come out openly and talk about it. They would talk about it amongst themselves. But tell us, we, we all know about Rosa Parks' experience in December of 1955. But we don't know much about your experience in March of 1955. Why weren't you chosen to be that model for ending segregation? Uh, I think uh, when that question comes to me, I was a minor, and the black people needed an adult person for the legal, you know, uh, for the legal uh, lords for all the legal action. And I was a minor, and I couldn't participate that way. But uh, I think the organization finally picked someone who they thought wouldn't be so militant, because uh, Rosa is kind of mild, in mild manner, a real genteel lady, like. And so they thought I was going to be closer to Angela Davis. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> a lot of people said it was skin color, but coming from a black community, I know if I was uh, my complexion, I know because Jim Crow is so great that I couldn't run for Miss Booker T. Washington. You had to have a, a, black, a black person had to have a certain length of hair and a certain skin tone. So a lot of the people feel that it was because Rosa had a fairer complexion than I had a finer, closer to white features than I mean. So, but I think it was because of the legal action and choosing the correct icon to keep this uh, movement going nonviolent. But I wasn't a violent person, but they didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that was a turning point in your life. Uh, what a other experiences that you consider as turning points? Um, well, uh, some of the turn. oh, uh, excuse me, explain what do you want me to say about turning points? The things that uh, happened to you that made you look at the world differently than you had before. Uh, uh, one of the things, uh, when Martin Luther King came down uh, and he uh, uh, organized the movement, uh, Different people, uh, you know, I saw different people of different color, and I saw white people uh, with the student groups, and I know that something was happening. If these white children come, to the bus, you know what I'm talking about, the buses, the bus ride in the city, I knew something was happening. I was at home watching TV. I was working hard, but I was glued to the TV to see what little news clip they were saying. Every time there was a sit-in, every time there was now something about a bus, uh, you know, some rebellion that was going on. I knew the white students, well, I had got the message that the black children, students wanted a change. They didn't want, they, well, they wanted to change so that they could have a better opportunity, have a better uh, career besides being school teachers and preachers and nurses. They, they wanted to open up the whole, uh, you know, the whole thing, so they, the educational process or the institutional process, so that they could get a different career, just than being school teachers and preachers and nurses. So I knew that was coming. Thank you. That, uh, I think, gives us a pause to invite a William Makiba once again for a presentation. Constitutional right, nigga! You know you need to give me that seat. Do you need me to get the police? to get up right now and get to the back of the bus. Now you know it's against the law. Miss Hamilton, she just got up. She went to the back of the bus. 
Mr. Harris, sensing there was going to be trouble, he got up and gave her his seat. Officer? No. Right. I didn't know it was against the law that a colored person had to get up and, and give a white person their seat when there are no vacant seats and colored people standing up already, sir. That's not what the city ordinance says. Get up, gal! No, sir. Now, I paid my dime. I paid my fares, my right, my constitutional right. I'm a citizen of the United States. You just read that 13th and 14th Amendment, it'll tell you so. <laughs> I know the law. My teacher, Miss Nesbitt, she's been teaching us the law. My teacher, she be pricking our minds, trying to see what we're thinking about. One day, she said, Who are you? Huh? Who are you sitting right here right now? Who are you on the outside? The person that people think they see, huh? Who are you? Who are you on the inside? How you think? How you feel? What you believe? Would you be willing to stand up for what you believe in, even if someone wants to hold you back because you're different? Do you like your beautiful brown skin, children? Do you? Hmm? Are you American? Hmm? What does it mean to be an American? Homework tonight, write me an essay. What does it mean to be an American? You need to understand who you are, children. <coughs> My teacher, she say we gotta speak for ourselves. She say we gotta act. She say that's why we study history and current events. So we can understand everything that's going on and, and, and we can do something about it. So say something, somebody. Don't you know your rights? You know your right to free speech, the First Amendment? Officer, I know that I hate Jim Crow. I, I know that if a man ain't got nothing worth dying for, he ain't got nothing worth living for. So you can give me liberty or give me death. <laughs> Ouch! I don't care. Drag me up in this bus. Take me to jail. Forced into the patrol car. They put handcuffs on me through the window. What's wrong with this little black? She ain't nothing but a little. Let's take her to Atmore State Prison and get rid of her. No, 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 no! Yes, sir. I was booked and charged for different things. Violating the segregation code, disorderly conduct, resisting arrest and assault. Yes, sir. You were found guilty for assaulting an officer. There are a lot of young people here. Uh, what would you have to say to a person who wants to stand up for what they believe? Uh, I believe that uh, if you see some injustice going on, or some, something that you think is not right, you, you feel that it's wrong, don't be afraid to stand up. Because if you stand up, most of the time one person stand up, someone else, you maybe another person stand up with you. But stand up uh, if you have to stand up alone. Stand up because you make it, you make the sacrifice, and you make it better for someone else. And um, for the, uh, I address this to African Americans because I feel that uh, the struggle was with African Americans, but it. 
uh, involves all races because you cannot, segregation is a burden when you have uh, for everyone. And you, to abide by these laws, you don't want people going around saying that, oh, she's mean to me because she's white. Uh, she mean to me because she's yellow or brown. But the younger children should learn that the world is not made up of one race. If you look at the map, you know it's not one race. The world is a, of a lot of people. We are the world. So uh, I say to the African American students, it's like my old teacher said, get in the books and read, because if you get an education, that'd be a tool for you to use for, for, for whatever career or whatever thing you choose to do. You will be more aware of your surroundings. And don't be afraid to make a difference. Stand up for what's right. Thank you, Claudette Colvin. And let me say finally that a man or a woman reaches, becomes mature because of the choices and the commitments they have. And these decisions where people attain worth and dignity by the multitude of decisions they make from day to day, the decisions take courage. And we are honored to be in the presence of courage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.